Hello graphics class and welcome to this supplementary video concerning the major and minor assignments in the class. Uh, the purpose here is to give you a reference concerning the assignments and so if you're ever confused about what you should be working on this would be a good thing to refer to. So we're going to look uh, quickly at the, uh, the assignments themselves and we'll answer a few questions you might have. Okay so uh, components of your grade this is a good place to start. Now, if you look at your objects assignment, the object assignment is the uh, one of the first things on the syllabus in that area, uh, and it comprises four different objects that you have to create. Collectively, that will cover 35% of your grade as a whole. So this is a very important assignment. Basically, if you don't do this assignment, uh, the highest you could possibly get in the class would be somewhere in the C range, and so that's not what you want to do. Okay, the final animation project is worth 25%, and it's related to the object assignment in that the object that you create in that assignment can be used in the final animation, but that doesn't mean that those have to be the only objects that you use. And quizzes and exercises, as you probably already know, uh, come to 20%, and the exercise part of that, those are the weekly assignments collectively. And so, uh, they're not incredibly uh, highly weighted, but they're still important. You know, whatever we do during the week, collectively that adds up to 20%. And of course, the exams are 10% each. Now, the objects assignment, uh, we need to talk about this in particular because I know it's a little bit confusing on the surface. So, the object assignment is to create four specific objects for four specific uses, and the intent is to give you a flavor for each of them, to give you an experience uh, that could help you decide if you want to do that sort of work in the future. So the first one would be print, a print object. And so when I say print, that means print on paper, and this is uh, using 3D graphics uh, basically for a 2D world of print, and there is a lot of, um, a lot of potential there. Uh, we also have the 3D printed object, uh, and this is a situation where you have the option to create something that's actually a three-dimensional object uh, that, uh, that you've designed. It uh, could be almost anything. We'll talk about that. Uh, you could also do a TV logo, uh, which would be an animation. Uh, this is something that you would see on television and usually plays for a few seconds, and it identifies a television show or a group or something else or anything you need it to be. You can also do something for multimedia, something that would show up on a, uh, um, a cell phone or something of that nature. Uh, or you could also apply this to a website or uh, something you're doing if you're a CIT major, you could really have fun with this. You could be a skin for a video game character or something like that. The potential is endless. And uh, finally, we have virtual reality, which is something that you might not even believe we can do, but we actually can where you can create an actual 3D world uh, where you can put your audience. Your audience can look around in a 3D world and you can populate that world with anything that you want. Uh, this could be used to demonstrate something or to create some kind of an artistic piece, something of that nature. Uh, and it's, uh, it's incredibly fun. And so I want you to consider that as a possibility. And uh, you need to do four of these. And it's important that you understand there are five possibilities. You really only have to do four of them. So that means, hypothetically, let's say you really don't want to do virtual reality. Well, you don't have to. Or maybe you want to do two multimedias instead of, you know, doubling up on some, or instead of doing all of them. Uh, maybe you really like multimedia. You want to get one more in there. You could. I would seriously suggest that you not uh, do all of them as one. In fact, really only do two if you're really going to do that. Uh, and, of course, uh, it's up to you which ones you want to do. And they need to be formatted correctly. I can't stress that enough because it's very easy to turn these in in the wrong format. So let's talk about print first, the actual print object. And this, again, would be an object that's used in print uh, that could be printed out on paper. Now, a print object ultimately gets printed out, as I've just said, so that means it has to be in a format that's paper friendly. And that would be the PDF file, just telling you ahead of time. And uh, you can print this out on any printer, but 
I would do it in color. I would flaunt it. I would really uh, uh, sort of hug the limits there. So uh, if you don't have a color printer of your own, I could print it out for you, or you could take it down to Office Depot or something of that nature, and they can print it out for you. And it can be any size. You can have a poster, anything like that, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, this can be an illustration, a logo, a letterhead. It could be a poster. It could be a book cover. It could be a uh, you know some sort of a label. All kinds of possibilities exist. And really, you should think about something you actually need, something that you want to do, and you can make that happen. And this requires no animation. It's only a single frame. It's a still image that is produced uh, using the, the program that we're talking about and uh, basically taken you know, from Modeler into the layout program uh, where it is a snapshot. In this case, it would be a high resolution snapshot. And that's it. And then basically uh, moved on to InDesign or some other print-based program uh, for final uh, formatting. And it's seen only from one perspective. Again, it's a 2D surface, so you don't have to worry about what's behind it. For example, if you had a logo that really could only be viewed from one side, that's perfectly all right, uh, because in this particular case, you don't need anything else. It must be high resolution because print demands high resolution. Anything that's going to be printed on paper requires a great deal of, uh, of detail. And so you'll have to make sure that you, you print it out at least 2,000 pixels on its smallest surface. And it must be formatted in the PDF format. So if you send me a JPEG image, I can't help you. That's not going to work. Because if you try to print a JPEG image, uh, it's not going to print out the way you expect it to. If you're doing a PDF and you plan where it's going to be in the paper, it's going to be exactly there. If you put a random bitmap image into the printer, it could show up in the upper right-hand corner. It could show up in the center of the page. It may not be the right size. So that's why we use programs like InDesign, which handle print. And you'll be, of course, shown how to do that. OK, so here, here are some examples. Uh, I just happen to uh, be an author, and I do my own book covers. And this is the sort of thing that covers the assignment. Here, if you look at the, the book cover for Web of Life, uh, this is a 3D model of the spaceship, and uh, the, believe it or not, the, the, the vortex was created in light wave as well. Uh, and there's another spaceship. I write science fiction. And these are what these books look like on display. And that's only one example. You could also take something like, like that uh, little, uh, and I think they call it a tent. If you were to produce one of those for something, uh, that would be perfectly acceptable as well. So there's all kinds of ways that you can do this. Now, 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing is something new. It's something that is taking the nation by storm. It's taking the world by storm. And it is so incredibly useful that it is terrifying, uh, meaning that there's no end to what you can print with this. Eventually, uh, mass-produced items may no longer be necessary, or at least not as necessary. You may actually have a 3D printer in your own home that can print out any devices you might need and stuff that we don't even think we can print yet. It's always possible. And so think in terms of an object, uh, you know, it, must, it must be printable. So the, uh, the 3D object has to get printed out in plastic. And so that's how it has to be turned in. So I have to have a picture of it, or I have to, I have to actually see it, of course, but uh, it will be uh, displayed on the website as a photograph. And of course, uh, you know, that's that. You know, it, it won't be just the actual file. It has to be printed. One of the reasons why we do that is that you have to understand how the 3D printer works. And so you have to, part of the assignment is to create an object that can print successfully. And that doesn't mean that some objects simply can't be printed. It just means that you have to have a strategy, which means it may take you more than one try. And so these could be models, you know, ship models, car models, prototypes, gadgets, jewelry, parts, inventions. And you can, you can possibly patent these things. And there's all kinds of things in the thing universe uh, that, uh, that would be examples of this. And you can add to the sum total of things in the thing universe. OK, this requires no animation whatsoever. In fact, it isn't even a frame. It isn't anything like that at all. It's just an, an object. There are no surfaces. It's a model only. It never gets into. Uh, Layout. So basically starts in Modeler, 
moves immediately into the MakerBot program and from there it gets printed. Okay, resolution is determined by the material. We really don't have any control over that, even though the 3D printer is capable supposedly of printing slightly higher resolution than the default setting. I have never been able to get it to do that. Pretty much you're talking about one-tenth of a millimeter in terms of resolution, uh, which is actually pretty good in most cases. And it must be formatted in the MakerBot format. So whatever it is that you're going to 3D print, it has to speak MakerBot, so you have to learn how to do that. That's part of the assignment. And these are a few examples of stuff that your fellow students have created. And I could not be more proud of these students. Uh, this guy uh, in, in, in particular, he scares me. He's so smart. Look at that. He printed a, a perfect model of the, the tower at Methodist. He really loves this school. A great, uh, great person. And we've also got this beautiful uh, dagger, which I'm not sure what that was from, but uh, the detail is pretty good on that. There's a desk ornament that somebody else made. And uh, of course, we have a Doctor Who fan over there who made the TARDIS. And you can see that there is virtually no limit to what you can do. Now, the TV logo, that's a little different. Uh, there, a 3D graphic could be used on television or video, something that you would see on the screen. So uh, it's not a physical thing. It doesn't get printed out on paper. It doesn't get printed out on plastic. It's only on television. So therefore, it's going to be a different type of process. Now, this could be a show logo, a monogram, an illustration, some kind of artistic work. Uh, for example, think of the, uh, like the Century 21 logo or the uh, 20th Century Fox logo as you see in the movies. Those are all examples of TV logos that you could do. Uh, it has to be animated, you know, at least five seconds long. Uh, so this is an animation that's going to play. So that means that you're going to take it from Modeler uh, then you're going to create your, you know, take it into layout, set up your lighting, set up your uh, camera angle, and then set up your motion. Whatever motion takes place is all done in layout. And then you export that as a series of still frames that get taken into Premiere and turned into a video. And it's as simple as that. And of course, you'll be demonstrating we'll demonstrate how that's done. Uh, you can have complex surfaces, lights, and camera angles. In fact, you should have complex surfaces, lights, and camera angles. Pretty much there's no limit to what you can add to this. And it must be in high definition video resolution of at least 1920 by 1080. You can put it in 4K if you really want to, but I wouldn't suggest it. It isn't necessary. Uh, but please keep it at high definition. Don't give me uh, standard definition because it's uh, nobody uses that anymore. And it must be formatted H.264 as an MP4 file. Okay, so this would be an example of a TV logo. And this was done for MU Reports. This was actually done for television. Now, it's not all that uh, uh, vibrant because it's intended to be kind of in the background. This is something that would play behind uh, a news anchor speaking. And you can see there's a lot going on, but it's not intended to be distracting. Now, there's another version of this logo, uh, this one here. And you can see that this is a little bit more dynamic, but you can see the surfaces used and the animation. And uh, this was uh, intended to be played in the front screen in front of the news anchors. And so this was actually used, and it certainly can be used. And this is another example of this uh, sports icon that was used, that was actually used in action. And you can see how that looks. This is the kind of work that I'm hoping to see. Now, multimedia is a little bit different. Multimedia is a 3D graphic that, that could appear on any computer-based device. And so, uh, for example, you could have a website that has some kind of a logo on it an interactive button or something of, the, of that sort, and that's where that would be in multimedia. Or you could even have something that appears on your cell phone, you know, something that gives you some kind of interactivity. And this could be a graphic for an app, an interactive button, an illustration, a controlled animation, whatever you want it to be. It should be interactive, which means that the person using it makes it do things. 
So if you hover the mouse over it, it bounces or something like that. Those are all possibilities. And it can have complex surfaces, lights, camera angles, and all of those things just like a TV logo. And the resolution here is flexible, meaning that it could be a different aspect ratio. It could be a tall video. It could be a wide video. Uh, it could be something that only occupies a small area of the screen. And so whatever the necessary resolution is, that's what it should be. It should be turned in in some kind of a context, meaning that if you're going to do web graphics, make a web page and put them on there. And uh, it's got to be submitted in the proper format. It could be a, it could be a Swift file or something of that nature. Okay, this is an older example of some multimedia. And this was done using 3D graphics. And as you can see, there's a lot of 3D graphics going on. That's a bit busy, I'll admit. But it's all interactive. So, for example, if you pass your mouse over this area, you see it kind of bounces at you. And the buttons light up when you pass over them. And so, really, most of the graphics are made out of these one button that shows up all the time. So if I click on that, for example, I can turn up the volume of the background music. And just by leaving it, it kind of goes back. And if I choose some of these other ones, for example, if I go to the curriculum, I get this. And uh, these are another set of buttons that are basically interactive. So when you pass your mouse over them, they turn blue for a minute. And uh, I'm going to brag about this. I enjoyed making it. And uh, here, I basically allow you to see the site in different languages. So if I hit Russian, for example, all of the menu options appear in Russian. And of course, you have to know how to spell English and Russian, but there's also, there's also German, Spanish, Japanese. Actually, we never finished Japanese, but that's okay. Uh, but you get the idea, and this would be something that could actually be done very easily with a LightWave program. Okay, now if you look here, and I'm, I've got it up here, uh, this is a cell phone app that I made so that it actually shows how you can use 3D graphics in the context of a cell phone. So for example, uh, those are 3D graphics. And if I click on the YouTube link, I go to YouTube, and let's see if YouTube will play properly. Yep. So there's my, uh, my animation that I made. May run a little slow. You can see it up there. And you can also see, well, I guess this has a, and that goes to the YouTube, YouTube site. And that's probably enough of that. All right, so you can also see I have all of my, uh, my books available. So if I hit one of those, like for example, Ramos, uh, Ramos World, you can see it takes me to Amazon. And it allows you to buy it. Isn't that something? And so there you go. Uh, this would be an example of um, basically interactive 3D graphics in a multimedia context. Now, virtual reality is wide open. That's where we got something new going on. Uh, these are 3D graphics that represent a VR environment. It could be a room. It could be a machine that you're demonstrating. It could be all kinds of things. Uh, it could include, it could be architecture. It could be a game of some kind. It could be an illustration. It could be some kind of fantasy. Whatever it is, you can do it. And uh, this should be a 360 view. You should be able to look at it from all angles. And so part of the idea is to create where you want your audience to be within the, uh, within the virtual environment so that they can look around and see what's there. Now, um, at the moment, we don't really have the ability to easily allow you to move around the room, but you can at least look in all directions in a 360 environment. Now, you can program in movement where you take them for a ride or something like that, uh, but the actual interactivity uh, really only applies to looking in all directions. Uh, you can have complex surface. Now, there's no camera angles because the user will see it from all possible angles. They'll decide the camera angle, which is what makes it so interesting. And the resolution has to match the Oculus. So that would be 
3840 by 1920, and that's what you're going to want to shoot for. Okay, so here we have a literal uh, VR recording, and so this is an interactive video uh, in a VR context. It's a 360 video. Now, normally, you would be wearing goggles to see this. You'd be wearing a, uh, an Oculus device, and basically, wherever you looked, you would see different things. Here, this, uh, this particular program, this VLC media player, will play back the, um, the video in such a way that you can control it with a mouse. So if I play some of this, you'll notice, you know, there's how this begins. Now, if I were to tilt, I can see around different things. Now, of course, the name of the video is The Experience, and uh, that actually took a while to render. And so you see you can look around it. And so here you can look down and see this weird stuff going on the ground. And now here we are. This is the experience. Now you're in a room. You can look. You can look at the ceiling. You can look at the floor. You can even look way back behind yourself. And there's always something there. You can even see dust floating in the air. And uh, this is as far as we got this particular opening area. But it's actually quite a good example of what can be done. And my hope is that uh, some of you will decide to take this on as something to, uh, to really work on. This is your last opportunity to disengage. Treatment will begin in five, four, three, two. And of course, now all kinds of weird things would begin to happen. We haven't gotten to that part, but we see we've got the room where the walls are shifting and everything like that. And uh, this is going to be interesting when it's done. It's going to be kind of like a haunted house. I don't think I'll have it ready for Halloween, but that was my original idea. Now, the final animation is uh, really comes into play the second half of the course. And by that point, we've gotten into dynamics and some other things that we haven't gotten into yet. And so you should be able to create some kind of a scene that includes multiple objects. And here, we're going to have to use creative lighting, some kind of... Uh, uh, impressive lighting doesn't I mean just it could be uh, it could be normal looking but it's got to be appropriate whatever it is and the surface has to make sense and you could have multiple camera angles that can really help multiple cameras you can even use and uh, it's got to be professional could be photorealistic if possible uh, or if that's not what you're going for at least make it uh, make it look appropriate and it should include some kind of dynamics. You have gravity, have things bouncing off each other, you know, things like that. And it should run for at least 20 seconds. So basically, I'm asking you to impress me, and I think you can. Okay, the minor assignments, pretty much done week by week. They're intended to help you. They're intended to give you experience. So do those assignments. Uh, don't act like your life depends on getting them perfect, but understand that they're intended to give you the necessary skills to do the real projects and uh, to understand you know, what it is that you're doing. And so that should be where you make your mistakes so that when you're doing the real work, you have a basis, you have some sort of a, a treasure house of information that's built up already. The tests measure your understanding of the theory and they're not as important as the skill. That is simply the way it is. And they're intended to provide a basic knowledge of the, of the course material and the idea of 3D graphics. And in some cases, it's actually hard to construct questions without talking about actually doing stuff because this is really a hands-on course. And that's basically it. So that's what I'm gonna ask you to think about for the duration of the semester. And uh, obviously you can ask me any questions you want to, uh, but it should be relatively easy once we get to the various units that cover these things.